Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello and welcome to this fourth class on special relativity. In the last lecture we derived the finally the dictionary of the transformations of special relativity. These, this dictionary will enable us to translate observations between one observer, one inertial observer, and another inertial observer who is moving with respect to the first one at a constant speed or constant velocity v. These transformations were actually first derived by Lorentz, uh, and he showed that Maxwell's equations actually transform uh, correctly under these Lorentz transformations. Now, it wasn't until Einstein that the physical meaning of these Lorentz transformations was realized, and Einstein independently derived these Lorentz transformations from his postulates of special relativity. So today, what we're going to do is first we're going to look at some properties of the Lorentz transformation and understand some of the mathematical aspects of it. We will define a few terms such as rapidity and boost factor. Then we'll go back uh, to looking at the relativity of simultaneity, lengths, and time dilation. But now we will have a concrete dictionary which will help us understand how exactly lengths are relative, how simultaneity is relative, and how time is relative. We will see in particular uh, two very fascinating aspects of the implications of special relativity. The first is length contraction. That is, rods which are moving with respect to another observer appear to be shorter. The second aspect is time dilation, which is clocks which are moving with respect to another observer appear to be running slower. We will then try to understand these phenomena more intuitively from the constancy of the speed of light relative to all inertial observers. So let's begin by first writing down the Lorentz transformations that we derived in the last class. These Lorentz transformations are the dictionary of special relativity which will allow us to translate observations of space-time points as described by one observer to the same space-time points as described by a second observer. So let's write down the dictionary first. Uh, we had t prime is equal to 1 over the square root of 1 minus v square by c square into t minus vx over c square x prime is equal to 1 over square root of 1 minus v square by c square into x minus v times t. y prime is equal to y and z prime is equal to z. Now this, this dictionary or transformation was specific to the particular case when we had two frames of reference. One frame S, in which we have the coordinates t, x, y, z to describe the times and locations of different space-time events, and another frame S prime, in which the same coordinates uh, or the same locations in space-time t, uh, t, x, y, z are described with a different coordinate system t prime, x prime, y prime, and z prime. And the frame S prime is moving with respect to the frame S. And as measured in the frame S, the origin of frame S prime is moving along the positive x-axis with a speed v. Okay, so if I want to uh, understand what the frame S prime is doing with respect to the frame X, uh, S, it's moving along the positive X axis with the speed V. Now let's first 
uh, rewrite these Lorentz transformations in a slightly different way uh, by shuffling some things around. Okay, so the first thing that we'll do is that instead of uh, using t prime and t, we will use c times t and c times t prime. Okay, so with that change, we will just multiply this equation on both sides by c. And in this equation, we will also write uh, t as c times t. So the next thing that we will do is define a quantity beta, which is v by c. Since we discussed in the last class that there is a speed limit of the relative speed between these different frames s and s prime, the speed v lies between plus and minus c. Okay, it would be negative if uh, if you think of the frame s prime as moving along the negative x direction rather than the positive x direction. So beta would range between minus one to one, and this is a parameter that describes which uh, the relative nature between the frame s and the frame s prime. And now we define a second quantity, gamma, which is 1 over square root of 1 minus v square by c square, which is equivalent to 1 over the square root of 1 minus beta square. This quantity, gamma, is called a boost factor. Now, there is only one real independent parameter here, which is v, or the relative speed between these frames. And beta can be thought to be a replacement for v, and gamma is just some, uh, some quantity which depends on beta. So let's understand how gamma depends on beta. So let's make a plot of gamma as a function of beta, or v by c. Okay, and let's take uh, positive speeds only, that is, the particle is moving along the x direction. Okay, something similar would uh, be true if the particle was moving along the negative x direction. So uh, we'll plot beta from 0 to 1. Okay, and 0 means no relative speed between the two frames, that is, the frames are at rest with respect to each other. And one would be the limit where the frame S prime is moving at a speed C relative to the first, to, or relative to the frame S. And uh, what we can now do is we can plot gamma as a function of beta. And the way we do this is we can see a couple of interesting limits. So if you look at gamma as a function of beta, in the limit beta goes to 0, gamma goes to 1. And in the limit beta goes to 1, gamma goes to infinity. And the behavior of gamma as a function of beta is monotonic as well. You can easily convince yourself of that. So we start with beta is equal to 0, where gamma is 1. At beta is 1, gamma goes to infinity. And in between, the behavior looks something like this. Okay. In fact, I should be a little more precise. As beta gets close to 1, gamma starts rapidly shooting up to infinity. So it looks something like this. And then as, as uh, beta gets close to 1, gamma rapidly shoots up to infinity. So now if you look back at our Lorentz transformations, you see that there are these factors of 1 over square root of 1 minus v square by c square, or factors of gamma sitting around. And therefore, uh, these factors of gamma will become large as the speed v becomes close to the speed of light. Okay. Another thing that it tells you is uh, as the speed becomes equal to, the, if the speed is equal to the speed of the light, obviously these transformations are ill-defined. So 
uh, strictly speaking, you can only work with frames S prime, which are moving at speeds which are smaller than C. Okay, they cannot be larger than the speed of light, and they cannot even be equal to the speed of light. So you can only talk about this dictionary, or the validity of this dictionary is only good for observers who are moving at speeds smaller than the speed of light with respect to each other. Okay. And uh, one more thing is that now we'd really like to understand this region over here where gamma starts to become large, okay, where, or where speeds are close to the speed of light. And so sometimes in order to understand this region a bit better, it's useful to make a redefinition of this quantity beta, which is V by C. And the way we do that is by defining something called a rapidity eta, such that eta is tan hyperbolic inverse of beta, or equivalently beta is tan hyperbolic eta. Now, let me just quickly remind you of some properties of this tan hyperbolic function. So, if I plot the tan hyperbolic value of eta as a function of eta, then what it looks like is something like this. As eta is zero, tan hyperbolic eta is zero. For small values of eta, tan hyperbolic eta is just proportional to eta. Uh, and this is true for both for positive and negative eta. And then as eta becomes large or it approaches infinity, tan hyperbolic eta asymptotes to a value of one. And similarly, if eta becomes negative uh, and large, uh, tan hyperbolic eta asymptotes to a value of minus one. Okay. So uh, you can see that uh, if tan hyperbolic eta is defined as beta, as the speed v approaches c or as beta approaches 1, we have a large range of eta values that describe very carefully how the value of v is approaching 1. So values of speed close to 1, okay, or values of beta close to 1 are described very uh, much more precisely by talking about eta values, which now are spread over a much larger range. Okay, so this uh, will allow us to describe speeds which are close to the speed of light rather than say things like beta is 0.99, which means the speed is 99% of the speed of light, or beta is 0.999. Uh, rather than trying to talk about these things as being so close to the speed of light that we have to keep track of how close beta is to one, we can now talk about a quantity eta. And this quantity eta would be much more spread out uh, so, for example, beta is 0.99 would map to a value of eta is 2.6 and 0.9999 would map to a value of eta is 4.9 uh, uh, or 4.95, okay? So, depending on how close you're getting to the speed c, you're just talking about relatively smaller increases uh, in eta, uh, sorry, relatively larger increases in eta, okay, which capture how close you're getting to the speed of light. So the thing to keep in mind is that there is still only one free parameter. That free parameter is v, or equivalently we can trade it for beta, or equivalently we can trade it for eta. Okay, and gamma is now a derived parameter which depends on either v or b or eta. So gamma, which is 1 over the square root of 1 minus v square by c square, is now equal to, or is the same as 1 over square root of 1 minus beta square 
which is the same as 1 over the square root of 1 minus 10 hyperbolic square of eta, which is nothing but the cosh of, uh, or the cosine hyperbolic of eta, or the rapidity. And for small values of v, that is for v much, much less than c, beta is much, much less than 1. And uh, therefore, beta is approximately the same as eta, OK? But it's only when the speeds start to get close to the speed of light that eta significantly differs from beta. That is, you're stretching out this region of um, this region, which is where the speed is close to the speed of light, over a large range of eta values. So now we can go back and uh, look at our Lorentz transformations. And uh, we can see that this quantity is uh, 1 over square root of 1 minus v squared by c squared is nothing but gamma. This is gamma. And v by c is nothing but uh, beta. Okay, so this quantity here is beta. So we can write our Lorentz transformations in this way. Ct prime is equal to gamma times Ct minus beta times x and x prime is gamma times x minus beta times Ct. Y prime is y and z prime is z. And since these are linear transformations, uh, we saw in the last class that we can write this using matrix notation. So let's do that. We can write ct prime, x prime, y prime, z prime is equal to gamma minus gamma beta 0, 0, minus gamma beta, gamma, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. So this is a transformation matrix. Which acts on um, CT, X, Y and Z, and this gives us our, our dictionary. Okay, it allows us to translate observations of space-time points or coordinates t, x, y, z as seen by one observer into the coordinates as measured by a second observer. Now, we already saw that we can define beta or uh, we can define beta as tan hyperbolic of the rapidity and gamma is cosh hyperbolic of the rapidity. So gamma times beta is just sine hyperbolic of the rapidity. So this transformation matrix lambda can be written in a slightly more different way. So let's define lambda as our transformation matrix. And lambda is only a function of v, or equivalently, lambda is only a function of beta or eta. OK, so lambda as a function of eta is cosh eta minus cinch eta, cinch eta, cosh eta, 0, 0, 0, 0. Now, you'll notice a few interesting things about uh, this transformation matrix. It looks very similar to a rotation, uh, a rotation matrix between the CT and X directions being transformed into the CT prime 
and x prime directions. Okay, so it looks similar to a rotation matrix, which would be of the form cosine theta, sine theta, or minus sine theta, sine theta, cosine theta. Okay, this is what a rotation by an angle theta would look like. So it kind of looks like a rotation between time and space, okay, with some interesting differences. One is that cosines and sines are replaced by cosine hyperbolic and sine hyperbolic. The second is that in a rotation matrix, you have one minus sign here. Oh, sorry, I made a mistake earlier. There should be a minus sign here. Okay, because it's minus gamma beta that appears here as well as a minus gamma beta that appears over here. Uh, the second thing is that in the rotation matrix, you, will, you have one minus sign and one positive sign. In uh, this Lorentz transformation matrix, you have two minus signs. Okay, or basically both of them come with the same sign. Okay, so if eta is negative, of course, these would be two, two positive signs. And uh, the third change is that this is not a rotation between x and t, but rather x and ct. Okay, so this is, a, so really it's telling us that though we thought of time and space as different quantities, because time is measured in seconds, positions are measured in uh, positions are measured in things like meters. Really, what we should think about is ct and x, and these quantities have the same units. Ct is, for example, if t is one second, c is three times ten to the eight meters per second, and therefore ct is 3 times 10 to the 8 meters okay this distance is also called one light second it's the distance traveled by light in one second so if we use the correct units to measure time rather than measure time in seconds we measure time in units of c times time that is the distance light travels in that amount of time then really we can think of this as some kind of rotation between time and space. Okay, now let's um, come, uh, so the thing about the Lorentz transformations that we derived are that they are for a very specific scenario where the origin in, in time and space, so if we take the event t is zero, x is zero, y is zero, z is zero, as described by an observer in frame S, then in frame S prime, the same event has coordinates t prime is zero, x prime is zero, y prime is zero, z prime is zero. If the origin in space and time was different for observer S prime, then these transformations would have to be modified slightly. So supposing the same event with t is 0, x is 0, y is 0, and z is 0 was described by t prime is t prime naught, x prime is some x prime naught, y prime is y prime naught, and z prime is z prime naught, then the transformation would just have to be modified in a very simple way. You would write c t prime minus c t prime naught, or let me write it this way. Let's write it in matrix notation. So c t prime, x prime, y prime, z prime would still be equal to this matrix lambda that we derived, which is a function of either v or eta uh, or beta acting on c t x y z. But now we had to add an offset, okay, due to this. So that offset would be uh, by this constant amount, c t naught prime, x naught prime, y naught prime, z naught prime, okay. This is if origin of 
uh, space time events uh, do not agree. Okay, that's just a simple offset. So that would make our Lorentz transformation uh, a transformation which goes from what we call a homogeneous transformation to inhomogeneous, okay, because we added an offset in space and time. So this inhomogeneous offset. Okay. But that obviously is a very uh, trivial change. 